exclusive conversation. Today, we are talking to the fairy godmother of inclusive design, Yuta Trevoranis. So, Yuta is a renowned researcher and a world expert in inclusive design. She is the director and founder of the Inclusive Design Research Center, which began all the way back in 1994 at the University of Toronto under a different name. And then in 2010, she moved the research center with her to OCAD University, which is the alma mater of both myself and Tanya. And in the same year, she also established our graduate program the Master of Design in Inclusive Design. Yuta's work spans inclusive design, accessibility, and social justice, and her impact is incredibly profound. The breadth of her research that has been conducted both past and present is truly astounding, and I think I speak for all of Manifold when I say that we feel incredibly fortunate to be able to grab some time with her, because she is certainly in high demand. And I think by the end of this episode, you will understand why. So without further ado, here is an inclusive conversation with Yuta. Well, thanks so much, Yuta, for being here with us. We're excited oh, to see you. It's a pleasure. <laughs> um, so... One thing that we were talking about when we were preparing for this chat was that um, like we all kind of we know you as this like prolific researcher and you're kind of like a godmother of inclusive design in a way <laughs> <laughs> um, and we've been through this program so we know you in that in that sense but we don't we wanted to know a little bit more about Yuta the person and wow. how you came to be like in this field, like I'm um, from your education, how did you start out and journey into inclusive design and then starting this program and all of the research that you've done? Could you tell us more about that? Sure, yeah, yeah. how far back do you wanna go? <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, well, d d I mean, usually when I'm asked this question, uh, they ask, how did you get into technology? Because they discover I'm not, I'm neither a computer scientist nor an engineer. And they say, well, well you know, what, how did you get into the, this technology world? Because uh, at the beginning of my career, I was frequently uh, the only woman within a, in many of the um, meetings or standards groups or uh, development uh, circles. And, uh, I trace it back to uh, the my first job after I graduated from uh, undergraduate. Uh, I had started out actually in medicine and I did pre-med at U of T, but I didn't like the way that medicine um, asked you to, or at the time sort of uh, treat just parts of people as diseases, the medical model. Um, and so I then went into occupational therapy, which promised a holistic view, but I didn't like that either because uh, the, the way that things were being taught, it was sort of a very prescriptive, very didactic teaching. So I caused a review of the program while I was still in the program, which of course doesn't um, make you very popular <laughs> with your teachers. Um, so then, uh, but when I graduated, my first job was at McMaster University. And it was, there There was an integration bill that had been passed uh, called Bill 82, which required that um, students with disabilities should be able to attend their home school. Um, and so McMaster University wanted to run a pilot program and I got to work with 12 amazing prospective students. Each of, um, each of the students had some barrier to participating in university. Someone who was blind, someone who um, couldn't speak, someone who, uh, etc. It was the sort of typical, here is a token group of uh, 12 students that they wanted uh, me to work with. And it, it was somewhat 
um, serendipitous and amazingly synchronous that at the time, um, so this was the late 70s, early 80s, the personal computer came out. And so uh, here we're talking things that are well before you were born. Uh, the Apple II Plus, the Tandy Model 100, the Texas Instrument, all of these uh, personal computers. And I thought, ah, here are amazing translation devices. It doesn't matter if you can't talk because we can um, use some other uh, movement that you can use to communicate with the computer and potentially then also have the computer speak for you. It doesn't matter that you can't see, we can um, create an, something that can read um, the, the text and speak it out for you. Uh, whatever voluntary movement you can make, we can translate into something else. So I saw it as a way of diversifying the the ways in which people could provide input and the ways in which they could receive information. Uh, um, of course, that to some extent went a little bit sideways. Um, I had these amazing, like these uh, utopian views of we were going to create this world where there would be a whole diversity of ways in which we could interact. Um, unfortunately, that sort of veered in a direction of uh, here are segregated ways that people with disabilities control a computer and this is how everybody else controls it. The next thing that happened was um, I got, uh, I, I started to work with a group that was doing publishing um, and because the publishing world back in the 80s there was something called SGML, um, Standard Generalized Markup Language is still, it's the, the, the granddaddy of, you were talking about great, uh, the fairy godmother or whatever, this was the, the granddaddy of um, HTML, which of course is the, the language on the web. And, and, and again, I thought, oh my gosh, look at the possibilities here, because I saw it as a way of pooling, bringing together this whole diversity of of um, content, of systems, of bringing people together that were, um, and, and being able to diversify the way that you consumed all of these things or you interacted. So again, I thought, oh, here's a great um, sharing tool or a way of bringing together diversity. And, and of course, again, what I was seeing was, um, that it became commodified, it beca became commercialized, and we had the, um, these popularity um, metrics that started to become part of it. And so that wonderful pool of um, the, the, the commons uh, started to move away from diversity and started to deny or uh, lose sight of the complexity that, that was our world. Um, so. The, and reduce it in, in all sorts of ways. So both of those experiences persuaded me that um, I was right right at the beginning that diversity is our most valuable asset. And why are we, why do we keep denying diversity? Um, and that we, our world is complex, is changing, and we are creating all of these blind spots by virtue of reducing it. And we're doing that in every part of our life, whether it's how we do research, how we design, how we develop things, how we create markets, how we exchange things. In every case, what we're doing is we are reducing the diversity, valorizing or rewarding sameness and conformity or the average the majority um, and or or competitively creating one winning best winner takes all um, thing that we're valuing and uh, at the same time then anything that deviates from that we're uh, getting rid of ignoring lacking the understanding of etc so that's that's where I came to inclusive design that that um, magic mix of uh, supporting diversification and celebrating and um, encouraging human differences. So people differentiating themselves and, and um, leveraging the strength of the fact that you're different 
and then the inclusion, the part where we orchestrate all of those differences, because that's, that's the only way we're going to survive is by pooling and um, not reducing difference or diversity and using those diverse perspectives, those choices that brings in terms of knowledge and skill to be able to, to deal with the really complex and changing, fluctuating world that we are in right now. Beautiful. That is so beautiful. <laughs> and I was uh, thinking about this utopian world you imagined once the computer became personal. And it reminds me a little bit of, I think, a book by Isaac Asimov about, I don't know if you've read him, the science fiction novelist. And I was thinking, if this utopian world, did it also inspire you to create this program at OCAD? And were you also imagining like a utopian way of teaching or what were your first um, thoughts about creating this program? Yeah, so I had been, um teaching for about 20 years in various post-secondary programs. And um, I've, I was very, very frustrated with uh, the way that education uh, was moving, in large part because of the way that, that education treated students who were uh, who learned differently um, in part but also because I was persuaded that we were preparing students um, to we weren't preparing students for the future that we were seeing so uh, when I uh, started the program at OCAD University what I wanted to do was I wanted to do all of the things that I thought were needed to prepare students for the the world that they would be encountering when they graduated uh, which is a complex world that requires um, diverse knowledge diverse skills and are and and that uh, learns to work together so teamwork collaboration um, I wanted students to be able to differentiate themselves from each other rather than becoming conformant, standardized, replaceable learners and therefore replaceable workers um, within the work world that they would graduate towards. So if you look at um, our certainly K to 12 or kindergarten to grade 12 and uh, um, even post-secondary and uh, education, what we're doing is we are causing students to competitively become standardized learners. So uh, the way that we create exams and we assess students, the way that we recruit them, the way that we um, mark them, the uh, way that we teach uh, everything that um, is being taught within our formal education system. And so the, the program that um, I started, I, I wanted students to practice inclusive design in the process of learning about inclusive design. So to co-create and co-design the education system together be, uh, and to uh, create a, a program where rather than encouraging students to become conformant and standardized and ranked on the same scale for every student to discover how they were different and how they could differentiate themselves what are the unique pieces of knowledge to learn about that but then also to figure out how to work together with their uh, fellow students to uh, be able to orchestrated into a, a something that is greater than the parts. And so the, the, the way I started the program or the first course that I wanted to start um, was I called unlearning and questioning. And the idea there was that there was a, a ton of stuff that students needed to unlearn before they could actually embark upon this experiment. And um, the, the the magic formula there was to bring together as diverse a group of students as possible. So not picking, cherry picking the best and the brightest from the applicants, but how do we create a group of students that are so different from each other that they will learn from each other 
And uh, so that bringing together these diverse perspectives and whatever perspectives were not within the cohort, I tried to bring into the unlearning and questioning as well. Um, the intent of unlearning and questioning was also to empower students to give and receive constructive critique of their peers because part one of the barriers to orchestrating your talents is not to um, put down uh, your fellow classmates or to try to be better than your fellow classmates but to help your fellow classmates to become the best that they are and not to see it as uh, something where, whereby if they do well, then you are lower down in the ranks. So um, the, the idea of we're all in this together, we sink or swim together, creating a cohesive learning community and tackling real authentic problems, not doing these disposable assignments, which are simply exercises to prove your mettle with respect to what the instructor wants you to learn, as opposed to what you feel um, would be something that you should learn to, and, and a way that you can hone uh, what you know to be your, your true skills. And then um, so that you can become a uh, a lifelong learner because of course upon graduation learning continues so all of those <laughs> that was a bit of a muddled introduction but um, it the idea was let's allow students to differentiate themselves work together um, a, a cohere as a learning community that would then carry them through life um, because life changes all the time and whatever you learned in school is probably going to be outdated by the time you graduate. So you're going to have to update that all the time. And you can do that with the support of uh, a whole diversity of peers. So um, what I was wondering when you were, you were saying how your intention to, for the program was like, was it hard to actually pitch this to the university? <laughs> So yeah. Different yeah. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I, we talk about in the the in inclusive design, the third one, your complex adaptive systems, the the third dimension of inclusive design, and we talk about friction points. And boy, did I cause friction points with with universities. Certainly, um, I had come from a a much more a much larger, more established recognized university, the University of Toronto. And in part, um, when I moved the center, I, I wanted to move it to a, a much more scrappy, um, flexible, adaptable, smaller university that would be uh, friendlier to these sorts of, of ideas. And a university that had a studio practice um, because there, there was a, a greater emphasis on individual skills. But, um, what I didn't anticipate was that uh, the, even that university was trying to become more like the other universities. And so, I, I mean, talk about all the things that, that went against university culture. Um, a recruitment, just picking students. Um, so the requirements that students had to follow in order to apply, they all had to sort of follow this formulaic application. And then um, the, the, the gatekeeping in terms of what students were not non-standard um, because they didn't have the right language scores or their marks were not high enough or their, um, their particular uh, records from previous universities wasn't the right kind. But those were exactly the students I wanted. I wanted the students that had been struggling and that ha had faced barriers because I was quite committed that those were the individuals that were the most resourceful, that were the most motivated, and that had the, the greatest knowledge of the barriers that people would face that you would need to have to design around um, or um, address uh, the, to uh, the marking. I mean, I, what I wanted to do was to have students be able to uh, use tests and assessments or exercises and marking to formulate or to, to do formative views of their own learning and to 
um, assess each other and help each other, give uh, constructive feedback that they could use. But of course, um, the, it was required that we mark everybody on the same scale again. Um, so uh, the two uh, instructions, um, the, the way that we taught, so um, being able to take students out into our community and actually do things that were um, that were actually going to last, that were going to be productive, that were useful beyond just the university environment. And there, um, the uh, ethics became a barrier, which you would think would not be a barrier, but um, our view of uh, the people with disabilities or community members as co-designers was completely foreign because the standard research practice was that uh, the these would be uh, research passive research subjects and the student or the researcher would be um, the objective uh, viewer of what was going on so the the thought that we would bring in um, the the community members as co-designers in the designs was something that the ethics committee didn't view us as, as so yeah i mean everything was was a friction point and of course the students came along with those friction points um and uh, we depended upon uh, i mean it was a a, a bumpy um <laughs> challenging journey for everybody so um, I think my probably my last question about the program is so I think we were cohort seven. I think so. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And I was, I mean, the program has obviously overcome those friction points, maybe to some degree, because it's to it, some it, degree, it, yeah, it, a little it, bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's thriving. There's like cohort after cohort. Um, and I know that, like, in many ways you've sort of launched this program and then it's it's maybe it's like a child that's grown up in a way <laughs> and you don't have to be as hands-on in the in the same sense i was wondering if you would ever want to or think of um returning to the program fully yeah so i'm i'm um the way that academia works is uh, if you're a faculty member, you get, you get a sabbatical. So seven years and it's a sabbatical. Right? Um, so you go off and you renew your, um, your research and your interest in the topic that you're working in. Um, uh, yes, I definitely want to uh, go, go back into the program and take, do uh, the, the next sort of round of things. There's so many things I want to explore within the program. One of the areas that um, I'm really passionate about at the moment and that has sort of taken off is uh, the AI ethics. So artificial intelligence and ethics because th that is seen as the next uh, techno solutionist wave at the moment. And uh, I, I'm qu quite worried about the way that uh, it's being applied and how it as well is accelerating and opt optimizing and um, just amplifying as well the, the exclusion of difference um, and pushing everything towards this notion of the standard or the majority or uh, the statistical average. And so I, I want to infuse the program with with that, um, and I'm I'm going to go uh, and back in and teach a number of of programs there because I think any designer that's graduating is going to have to deal with uh, smart systems and artificial intelligence, smart cities, etc. And so we need it. We need to infuse the curriculum with some understanding of that. Um, I also want to. Uh, create something that isn't um, in a single program. I, I'd like to um, bring together numerous universities and uh, create uh, a 
um, I guess, a, a, a learning program that extends beyond the years that people are in university and that extends beyond a single university. One of the things that I was most frustrated about um, was just how we weren't able to uh, support the students that couldn't afford university, whether it was moving to um, a, a city like Toronto where finding a place to live um, and su supporting yourself while you're there, and then tuition fees, um, which are although lower than some countries, were still uh, exorbitantly high. Um, and so I, I had tried throughout to figure out how to support students financially. So what, what I would like to do is to create a program that is financially uh, inclusive as well. Um, and so that I'm looking at a whole bunch of uh, possibilities there, uh, both in terms of offering the content of the course and participation in the course in such a way that you don't have to pay for it, that it can fit it for uh, students that can't leave their home. Uh, I mean, we had remote participation, but I would love to have a way. Yeah, <laughs> Tanya, you, you, yeah, you attended remotely. But I'd, I'd also like to make it more flexible as well, so that if you're supporting a family and having to work um, and take care of uh, kids or elders, uh, then you can still fit it in. Um, a, a, something that is where the program is as adaptable as possible. Well, one of the um, interesting things about the program that I think stands out, but also clearly the works in this year and in its flexibility is, you know, when the pandemic hit, um, we were in our final semester and everything shut down and then everything had to move remotely. And I noticed because I was taking classes um, uh, that were in other programs, how different the, the impact was for those programs versus our program. Mm -hmm. I mean, it pretty much, it kind of, I mean, it, it really kind of disheveled things in other programs. Whereas with the, in, within the inclusive design program, it was just like business as usual <laughs> <laughs> in a way. Um, so, 2020 has been like an incredible year. And this year more than ever before, the survival of our connectivity and our continued economic production depended on the internet. Mm -hmm. And we had that already in our inclusive design program, so it was business as usual. So um, we were wondering, um, we know as inclusive designers that there is a need to make the internet more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and we were wondering how can designers ensure that the internet is a global public resource and accessible to all? Yeah, and that, that's a great question. That's one of, one of the questions that I've been working on in, in a whole range of ways. And I think it has, to, we need a multi, uh, a very variable and um, multi, uh, perspectival approach. Uh, one of the things, of course, that we found is that uh, prosperity and economic affordability is often a barrier. Um, and so one thing that I've been looking at is working with governments and markets and economists to look at how do we address the, the rising disparity that exists within the world um, at the moment. That, that sounds very um, utopian again. But uh, the, the, this um, strategy or this system that we've created is taking us in a, a completely uh, catastrophic direction. The more the haves get and the, and the have not struggle, uh, the worse things uh, get. And so um, disparity is something that I think is at the root of, or one of the things that's at the root of so many issues, including uh, our treatment of the environment, um, the, the um, violence that is happening in places, the uh, 
I mean, a lot of things, I mean, all of these issues and barriers are connected. But um, one thing I think we have to address is to recognize that the internet is a common good. If it, it is a right to get education, it is a right to work, it is a right to have food, um, it is a right to be able to express ourselves. And the way that we're doing it right now is through the internet. And so the internet needs to be a common good that is a right for everyone. And uh, we can't use, if it is the vehicle whereby we deliver those human rights, then we can't uh, commodify it and uh, extract um, payment for it such that there's only um, a certain group of individuals that can use it. So um, I'm working on trying to figure out policy and uh, supports. So first off, we need to make the internet um, free. And then second of all, um, we need to be support people in getting the devices that they need to uh, actually participate. Um, the the and that also is has an economic part to it, but it it means a different kind of market as well. So the the we need to sh shift the way that we commercialize and market and sell, um, advertise, distribute uh, goods. Uh, the most of the devices that we have are uh, because of the way that we've been marketing them the the less used devices are not interoperable with the standard systems and so the inclusive design comes in there um, we need to be able to create an integrated um, non-segregated system where you can a whole diversity of, of individuals using a whole diversity of devices can be connected to each other. And it's not difficult to do. It's just uh, we are creating a system that um, serves the majority, the most popular, that amplifies that popularity, that then um, causes anyone that that deviates too far from that majority to not be served well um so yeah there's um and that that then gets to add even more fundamental things like how do we plan how do we scale how do we design and that's where inclusive designers come in um we need to design for diversity not design for the largest customer base um we need to market um in such a way that um you can the whatever system we're marketing has all sorts of choices for it, recognizing human differences um we need to uh, scale by diversifying not scale by formulaic replication um everything needs to i mean diversity is our, our greatest asset um and it's the only way we're going to get out of this crisis i there's a um, I mean, I've been trying to express it in such a way that it's understandable by uh, people that may not understand technology or that may not be um, that used to t technology. And one thing, one anecdote that or one uh, metaphor that has been working is if you think of our world at the moment, the crisis we're in and what we're facing as a um, as a global community, it's the, um, what we're facing is a very, very complex adaptive terrain that is in flux. So think of it like um, a number of mountains um, where you have uh, a peak that we have to reach in order to get out of the oncoming flood, but we're stuck on this small mountain um, because we, 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 we know only that we have to climb up, that we have to optimize whatever we've done before. And so we keep going up, 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 and um, it becomes steeper and steeper. Um, and only a certain uh, number of people are there. But what we actually need to do is we need to climb down from that mountain and find the, the real global optima, the real high uh, mountain. And that means that the people that are down 
um, at the moment that are doing the opposite of that optimization, that um, have a view to things that are not the top of this little mountain that we're currently stuck on are the ones we have to depend upon. And so uh, that applies to our market. It applies to how we learn. It applies to our communication systems, everything. Uh, look to and follow the people that um, are at currently at the margins that have perspectives we've been ignoring. That, that sounds like uh, amazing. And I think like as graduate designers from the program, we've been a little bit struggling with the business part of it. And how do we do that? How do we really sell the business case? And how do we market it differently in, in the sense of not not using charity based action how how do we move away from that i guess that's my question <laughs> yeah so um i th i think that's actually quite an easy one because um if what so i i've been talking to quite a number of companies and if what you are looking towards um is to survive as a company and thrive um, to create a sustainable company, then what you need is you need to continuously innovate um, and you need to create a, a system that um, is resilient and that is adaptable. Uh, quite often companies and, and uh, businesses say, oh, well, it, it'll cost too much to make it inclusively designed. Um, but what we've discovered is actually that um, if you design for the greatest diversity of users, and especially for people that can't use or have difficulty using the, the systems that currently exist that are within your market, then um, you are going to create a system or a product that is much more adaptable. So as the world changes, as tastes change, as um, uh, people's needs change, uh, you and, and as you need to interoperate with new things that come into the market, um, your system that you've created will be much more adaptable. Uh, and uh, so then you, it'll survive longer. And so you will actually reduce the cost over the, the um, more than short term. If you only design for the largest customer base, for the, the majority, um, or uh, a particular um, slice of that, then your system will become very brittle, um, whether it's a service or whether it's an app or uh, uh, a platform, uh, you will not have thought of certain things that might go wrong. And so there will be many more requests for uh, changes to it, adaptations to it. And because you haven't created a system that's adaptable and flexible right from the beginning, um, it's going to reach end of life very quickly because you will have to modify it and modify it and modify it. And so it will cost a lot more. Um, the I think many of the larger companies that are surviving are recognizing that they need to, to have diverse perspectives be there and that those diverse perspectives not only need to be served, but that they need to be within the company. They need to be the co the active co-designers of whatever um, it is that they are producing. Uh, and those are the companies that are able to survive the changes that are happening here. So the business is starting to recognize the importance of inclusive design. Thank you. Uh, uh, I was thinking when you were talking just now about the larger companies uh, recognizing the need for diversity. Um, this year in particular, because of so much that's happened in the world, and especially in the States, there's, like, I find everyone is now talking about um, like companies are all now talking about DNI, di diversity and inclusion initiatives, and it's 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 become like a it's a big corporate push I find from a lot of companies, and I want to, I just wanted to get your 
your perspective on this, but sometimes I find that companies are reactive, not necessarily yeah. proactive. Right. And now that they're they're pushing these DNI initiatives, there's it feels a little bit like a buzzword at times. Like there's it's still a very superficial layer, and there's something deeper that seems a deeper understanding that seems to be missing. And I don't really know <laughs> what that is, but I thought I'd just throw it out and see what your yeah, I, I agree. I, it's um, many companies are doing sort of a performative yes. version of um, of DI. Um, they uh, and oh. they they are doing sort of the token formulaic version of it. Uh, let's get we've ticked off this box now. Let's tick off that box, and that it, it yeah it it. it they're not recognizing that it goes so much deeper into uh, company processes. It's not something you relegate to a department. Here, you you make sure that we've ticked off this box. Um, the w There's an, another worry that I have, and that is, and this is one of the reasons why I focus a lot on disability, because one of the other things that, that I, I think is destructive of that diversity inclusion um, formula that that we're trying to reach is uh, the the clustering or grouping uh, of bounded categories of people. So fragmenting that diversity and saying here's one particular group and he and these are the characteristics of this group and people either belong to that group or don't belong to that group and. Um, uh, any one member of that group can represent all other members of that group. Um, and so, and, and that is, a, I think, uh, a, a destructive conception because uh, the, we're, we're all very, very diverse and to create these bounded categories um, and have uh, criteria for belonging or not belonging means that a lot of people get, uh, fall between the cracks or get stranded at the edges of that. And it makes it even more difficult for people that don't fit into those bounded categories to get included or to, to um, have this, the, the type of uh, uh, accessibility or inclusion that they need. And I, one um, illustrative place where this is happening is in AI ethics, which I was mentioning was something that I was looking at because um, there's a lot of buzz at the moment about the way that artificial intelligence and smart systems are um, excluding uh, uh, anyone that is divergent or different. So because of the data sets that these systems have been trained on, that there's algorithmic bias, that there's huge data gaps. And so we have taps that won't recognize dark skin. We have um, a, a, a whole range of ways in which um, people are discriminated against by these automated decision systems. Um, and th th that's hugely important and we do need to address it but the way that we're addressing it is by um, creating these bounded identity groups and saying um, he, this this is how these individuals are discriminated against um, the the way that we detect discrimination is to say uh, here is the um, the way that the majority are treated and let's compare it to the way that this bounded group is treated. Um, or the other uh, way that we're addressing AI ethics is to say there's a, a gap. So we need full representation of all of the different groups. Those are both really, really critical agendas, but it misses the fact that um, if you ha if you have a disability, there is no single data point that is common to everyone. The only common data point is that you are sufficiently far from the average that things are not designed to work for you. And so there, 
there's no way to use both of those tools that have been created to detect whether people with disabilities are discriminated against. And even if we have proportional representation of everybody with a disability in every data set, um, the, the majority will still rule. And so it's not just um, addressing those current flaws within the system, it's we have to change the whole system. Um, and that means not using big data, not using average or majority data to make the decisions. Our decisions, our, the way we decide has to change. And even when we have personalization, so even when we're using artificial intelligence to personalize voice recognition or, or um, those things, uh, seeing AI, uh, so recognizing our environment and telling someone who can't see that this is the male washer more, the female washer more, this is whatever medication. Um, the individuals that live in areas that are not majority areas or that use products that are not majority products are again um, losing out. It's the further you are from the majority or the average, the more you need these types of things, but the harder it is for you to use them. So um, we, we really need to address how we design almost everything. Um, we need to start at the edge and um, yeah, that's, you know what, I, um, you were talking about COVID. Um, that I, I think one of the things we've learned is that whatever we did to be more inclusive pre-COVID is benefiting everybody right now, right? Uh, and yes, we, we set up the program um, such that people could participate from all over the world. We wanted people different cultural experiences, different lived experiences, languages, et cetera. And uh, to do that, we had to create a hybrid pro program that offered students all sorts of choice. And that meant that we prepared the program to be able to, uh, and uh, yeah, it's, an, it's an exa uh, a great example of how you create a resilient system and you save money and, and problems in the long term by virtue of uh, designing it so it works for diversity. So um, I was just thinking, one thing that we what motivated us in starting the podcast is um, we were saying that a lot of people are well intentioned and have a, a real interest to be more inclusive and to um, sort of do their part in changing the world, but they don't know how to actually do inclusion, so to speak. I'm doing air quotes. And for the average person um, who's not formally trained in inclusive design or in this thinking and this way of being, like what is one single thought or belief that they could adopt, in your opinion, that would just help them self, help to set them on the right path? Yeah. I, I think the first thing is to um, recognize, value your own diversity. Um, a, a lot of the exclusive uh, sort of discriminatory stereotyping behavior comes out of a sense of insecurity. The, the feeling that um, you are not the best, that, the, this notion of the best and that life is a competitive process where um, you, you know, when so someone is up, um, somebody else is down, um, that, that local hill that we're all trying to climb so, um, is, is something that causes a lot of the, the negative behavior that, so value your own diversity, learn to differentiate yourself, and then um, the next part is, is figure out how to orchestrate what you contribute to the world with the, all the other diverse individuals. Don't see other people as competitors um, and design to uh, include or to um, optimize to value that diversity in, in together. Um, so it's those two, those two things, but you have to start with yourself. Um, find out how you are what what unique thing you contribute to this world 
and then um, discover other, the unique contributions of others and figure out how to work together to make to um, knit together a, a, a bigger inclusive whole. The quest of self inquiry. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, like Soya said, you are the godmother of inclusion. <laughs> <laughs> And here in Mexico, it's, it seems like Godmother is someone that shows a way. So I think uh, like in the, uh, it's like more set in a spiritual path, but, uh, but uh, taking it to design, you do show a way to inclusion and it's great hearing you. It's really inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. And it's so lovely to see both of you. <laughs> it's just, uh, I miss uh, all of you quite a bit. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm so looking forward to see what you do as inclusive designers. I think you're going to do amazing things. Thank you. Well, we learned from the best. So. <laughs> we did. Thank you. Okay, so that is it for this inclusive chat. Um, as usual, Inclusive Conversations is presented by Manifold. You can find out more about us and what we are working on at hellomanifold.com. For more information about Yuta or any of the projects she's working on right now, you can find her and all of that information at idrc.ocadu.ca. And all of these details are also in the show notes, so you can find all of these links in the description. If you enjoyed anything you heard here today, please consider hitting the subscribe button wherever you may be listening to this podcast. And if you feel particularly generous, please share this with a friend.